Welcome everybody again at day four of the Atelier for Solidarity organized by the Festival Academy, an initiative of the European Festivals Association, though it feels like it is day 15. Um, thank you, Anna, Carla, uh, Fonseca, Reis, to join us this early in the morning. So good morning, Americas. Uh, good afternoon, Europe, Africa, Mina, and good evening um, to Asia, Oceania. The Atelier for Solidarity is set up as a response to COVID-19 to reimagine our world uh, together with some 80 artists, curators, festival managers, and cross-sectoral organizations. So we are delighted to welcome Anna Carla here with us today. Uh, she will talk on the topic of um, creative industries and their role in the current challenging times. So the floor is all yours and Mike van Graan, South African playwright, will facilitate this conversation. Thank you very much, Inga. Welcome, Anna Carla. We have an hour for this particular keynote. So you have about 30 minutes to blow us away, Anna Carla, and then we'll have about half an hour of questions and commentary afterwards. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, over to you. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everybody. Just wondering where you come from. Uh, Oi, Luis. Can get a clue from the names, but not quite. So uh, maybe afterwards we can. Oi, Lu. Hello. Good to see everybody. Um, so let me share the slides. Uh, very excited to be with you. I've been following part of the, um, the program. Uh, congratulations on the organization. Really, really great and challenging. Can you see the presentation? Yeah, good, fantastic. So uh, I realized that all the other keynotes were very inspiring and people talking from the roots and from the heart. So I was just wondering how I could bring industries into this kind of a mood and the same kind of vibe. And I realized that actually we need to um, put two things together. So the role of creative industries in the current crisis, uh, but also the role of the current crisis in the creative industries. So um, I think that we need to go one step back and um, in search of the new normal, try to uh, realize where we come from. And uh, this is something I really like bringing to the table. Uh, early morning here, you can hear the birds. Um, this is uh, a study run by the um, World Economic Forum. Uh, every year they have this global risk report. This is the latest edition. And it's, uh, it's kind of striking to see that there's not really a mention to COVID but we can see where uh, the global risks, therefore the risks that would actually provoke a turmoil into society uh, were predicted to be. So the forecasts they had previously to COVID were uh, focusing on climate action failure, extreme weather, uh, migration, social instability, things that we are very uh, familiar with but the, uh, the one thing I like about this report is that they um, show us that regardless of the fact that we work with environment, with culture, with economics, with uh, politics, whatever, we need to make sure that we have a, a cross-sector view to the challenges and to the risks. Because in the current complexity of the world, there's no one who can actually uh, manage to have all different information, uh, establish unlikely connections to make sure that all these challenges will be addressed. So we need to have different perspectives uh, at the same, to the same uh, problem. And this is one of the things I really like about this kind of gathering you're organizing and gathering people from, from all different countries and uh, talks coming from different walks of life, because it's really important to have this more kind of uh, holistic approach to the complexity of our current world. Um, and one of the problems we're actually trying to tackle 
uh, Inge told me that you were mentioning the burnout society or the, 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 what used to be called the burnout because they're not quite sure what the current burnout is. Uh, and this book you may be familiar with from Byung Chul Han. And if there's any Korean in the, uh, in the room, uh, he or she will most likely help me with the accent. And Byung Chul Han, uh, among other books, has this uh, burnout society, a very interesting uh, perspective to our uh, more kind of liquid in the Bauman's um, meaning society where we run, 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 and we don't really have time to do the things that count most. And we don't have time to celebrate. And we're always in a rush, uh, but we always feel guilty because we don't really manage uh, to do what, everything we can. And if we're working, we're not with the family. If we have with the family, we're not really working or studying. So we always feel that we are uh, just unable to cope with all different challenges. This was already the, the old normal. Just to give you um, a bit of perspective in terms of numbers, Brazil was the, the number one country in terms of anxiety in the world. Almost 10% of the population uh, in Brazil used to be classified as anxious people. Uh, regardless of the fact that we tend to be seen as people who are very friendly and uh, smiling and happy, etc., etc., we are always very anxious. Um, but the level of depression and other mental diseases uh, in the whole of the world was, was really astonishing. It was really striking to see. Uh, and all the doctors that we've been talking to um, in different countries uh, predict that we're going to have uh, kind of an avalanche of uh, mental diseases after COVID because uh, we weren't really able to cope with the old normal. We don't know where we're going to. And all this uncertainty will be uh, very bad in terms of um, our feeling of being able to cope with different perspectives and we, uh, with the things we need to pull together. So uh, I tend to believe that the burnout society will be one of the big chunks of the need of our society. And the good news for us working with culture is that there are already all different experiments uh, being done in all different parts of the world uh, about the, um, the help that art and culture can bring to mental diseases. This is one of the many initiatives coming from uh, Montreal in this case, where the Psychiatrist uh, Association um, had an alliance with the uh, Beaux-Arts Museum. And for all a series of cases of depression, people would get a voucher to go to the museum and contemplate uh, and analyze the composition of visual arts. So they realize that when we have uh, an experience and we really interact with uh, painting, sculpture, uh, theater, movies, whatever, uh, we really get into that, that can actually activate parts of our brain who are responsible to uh, fight against depression. Uh, you may have heard of uh, vitamins of culture from Scandinavia, all different countries, and also uh, a report from uh, Denmark showing that the, uh, the level of investment you have in this kind of programs is actually cost benefit because you invest less than the cost of having someone with depression in society. So I think that this is one of the ways we can actually try to, uh, to uh, follow to make sure that we can survive to this uh, pandemic. And uh, obviously also post COVID, talking about sustainability, because then, ta-da, voila, pandemic arrived and we need to uh, do something with that. And what we realized also uh, day one was that people uh, were asked to stay apart, which is something especially for, for countries like those in Latin America, but not, also, not only uh, here, it's, it's really hard, it's really hard not to be touching people, not to be hugging people, not to be in contact with people. So physical presence is really something that is amazingly important for us. And this comes from, this picture comes from Medellin in Colombia. And you can see the, uh, the look in the eyes of the kid. You know, it's, it's something really uh, astonishing. So uh, then we started realizing that it was time to do something. We uh, saw all different news on media, the beginning of a new year and how culture uh, can actually uh, cope with that. 
uh, different initiatives like uh, in South Africa, uh, different festivals, everybody trying to go digital, which is something that is not very easy for all different countries, like in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. Um, so it's not as simple as that. Um, India with the art competition united against Corona. So all different expressions of we can do that, we can fight that, we can cope with that if we are together. Uh, Buenos Aires, Cultura in Casa, uh, Culture at Home. So all different initiatives from the government, from the, the um, civil society. Uh, this is from Sao Paulo, the uh, Latin American Memorial, which is something there's uh, a cultural center that is very, very harsh, very, um, not very friendly, actually. This is one of the uh, few initiatives where I saw everybody together in the place. Now is running, starting today, actually, um, a theater, driving theater, which is something that is obviously more sensible to uh, places where you have a culture of the car, which is the case in Brazil, but also people who got together and decided to organize things like the kiting night for kids, uh, so they don't you know, get bored. Um, and I found this, this uh, mention from the trombonist, the Shanghai uh, Orchestra's principal trombonist, very touching, saying that all the doctors and nurses were working so hard to help. And then we thought, what can we do as musicians? And I think this is something that is, is very familiar to all of us. Um, what can we do about that? How can we survive? And what can we do about that? How can we join our forces? So we started seeing all different things coming together. Festivals, uh, you uh, spot a few of the things you probably have been discussing. Uh, opera singers uh, and the verandas and Italy and Spain and all different places, people doing lives all the time. Uh, and this is one of the initiatives I really like because it's it's out of the normal. And I think that to cope with the uh, the not normal phases, we do think we need, do need to think out of the box, therefore out of the normal. And this comes from uh, Brazilian muralist Cobra. Cobra uh, is 44 years old. So street art obviously is one of the uh, most complicated areas to work with uh, right now because we, are, we have this stay uh, at home measures uh, very strict in, in all different places. Uh, but Cobra realized that he had to do something. So he painted this uh, serigraphy depicting five children, as you can see, representing each one of the uh, biggest religions in the world. And, um, and Cobra decided that this painting called Coexistence would uh, be the base of a raffle for, uh, to collect, to, to raise funds for um, people who are in need of food and supplies. So anybody giving four euros uh, actually gives um, a kit, especially to, uh, to migrants in Brazil, who actually, as you can imagine, don't have uh, employment nowadays. They don't have a job, they don't have a work, and they have kids. So he, uh, he said he was not able to cope with the uh, idea of being at home and not doing something to, to help these guys. Uh, and anyone who donates 1,000 or more kits actually uh, automatically gets one of the prints, numbered prints, and they so far have collected money for 11,000 kits. So it's interesting to see how we can actually do something uh, differently when we think in terms of solidarity uh, in a dire situation. This is Cobra, a self-taught painter. And as um, Ottone uh, in UNESCO said, in moments of crisis, people need culture. And I think we, uh, we can only uh, agree with that. But that's fantastic uh, in terms of citizenship, in terms of solidarity, in terms of feeling part of uh, giving something of ourselves to the rest of the world when we were in need. But how can we actually survive to this phase? So this comes from Australia. If you take a look at the uh, all different areas, uh, the only pink um, square you have, it's arts and recreation services because it's the worst in terms of percentage. Therefore, 46% of uh, businesses are uh, running, kind of running, not uh, fully. 
uh, and it's obviously something that we uh, we see in all different places. Uh, in Brazil, just to give you an idea, yesterday I was talking to a lady responsible for uh, financials of a support system for micro and small enterprises, something we call Sebrae here, and she was saying that 90% of the uh, entrepreneurs in creative industries are what we say negativated, therefore they can't have access to credit and banks because they have any kind of debt be it legally, be it financially, etc. So it's a very, very striking situation for all different places. 46% in Brazil would be uh, a dream. Uh, in Australia, as you can see from the other numbers, it's already a disaster. And then you see also responses from different governments like Germany, um, because they realize that we need not only to create and work, but we also need to live. And this is something that we all understand because before the post-COVID world, there is the COVID world, and we don't really know how much it will last, how long it will last. Uh, there's a KPMG report just uh, being released right now saying that uh, forecasts say that from uh, one, and a, one and a half years will be the kind of short term for leisure, entertainment, and arts. So if we are to recover, it will take at least one year to reach this new normal. I think that the, uh, the rule today is to understand how we can actually survive this one year we have ahead. Obviously, depending on different countries, but average one year. And we see all, see all different initiatives trying to cope with this new situation and to respond. This is, is something you may, you may have seen, the Flamingo Lips. Uh, they have this kind of bubble, so we can actually attend and have experience because we do need to experience things when we are going so much digital. Uh, have experience in festivals and so forth. Loads of criticisms, but loads of, uh, of smiles in, in the bubbles. So we are trying to find our way through. And I think that all different initiatives and experimentations are valid at this point, because we do need to have responses uh, and to experiment new things. So it's a kind of trial and error we are going through. Lab Fantasma or uh, Ghost Lab is um, an entrepreneurship in Brazil. Uh, that reinvented itself all different times. So it's uh, actually run by Emi Sida, a very well-known singer in Brazil and his brother. Uh, and uh, this lady is their mother actually. And they've been through everything. So they started singing, they changed the style, they added different things, they went through uh, fashion. So Sao Paulo Fashion Week for, week, for instance, is the fifth, fifth, fifth biggest fashion parade in the world. They've been to Sao Paulo Fashion Week. So they are everywhere. They started to um, diversify their work. And now they have a kind of a holding of small uh, enterprises, all related to cultural industries and the creative industries. So uh, they have their own channel. They have their own brand. They, are, uh, they have their own clothes, uh, lab, fashion. Um, they've received all different awards, like best singer in the category, diversity at Sao Paulo Fashion Week, also supported by uh, Ghost Lab, uh, music specials, so all different awards you can imagine. But there are different initiatives in all different parts of the world. So the Patreon you may have seen comes from uh, the US. Uh, they propose to change the way art is valued, as you can see. And the one thing I like uh, about what they propose is to have this kind of a menu of different ways artists can be supported, uh, depending on their level of uh, um, number of uh, fans, uh, how well known they are, uh, if they are in desperate need or money or not. So they have this uh, premium, the freemium, the professional uh, kind of uh, kit or package of uh, initiatives, and they work with all different uh, initiatives. So nonprofits, visual artists, as you can see, all different kind of uh, chains. And this is uh, the level of support you can get depending on what you choose. So exclusive videos, you, you pay uh, $5. You just get closer to the action, you get $2. You want to have a, a live, a private live with your preferred singer, you pay more. And they actually propose different uh, kinds of uh, initiatives to make sure that you get more support from your fans and you're not only depending on 
uh, fundraising, crowdfunding, uh, calls, governmental help, and so forth. We've joined a task force from the IADB, the Inter-American Development Bank. And one of the things we were discussing is that after these short-term measures uh, and financial help that all different countries are dealing with in different levels, uh, we do need to get something that is kind of more stable. So this post-COVID or towards the post-COVID phase, we do need to do something that is more kind of stable. Um, most of the initiatives go through digital, but again, this is not the only solution we, we can find. And this is uh, really complicated for all different countries in the world like mine. So uh, one of the other things we're discussing is how we can actually get to the streets. Once we can get to the streets, can we use, for instance, the parklets for kind of networks of small cultural initiatives, small cultural centers, temporary installations? How can we go to the streets and make sure that we get the contents of the cultural centers to public space? This is one of the things we've been discussing. Um, but if you look uh, and we make one step ahead in the future and we try to look ahead in terms of insights, um, I think that everybody will agree that culture will be increasingly important as we shape this new future, this new normal, this new whatever it will be. So we need to be more kind of proactive. Uh, and I think that one of the things we need to do to, to reach this point is actually to change perspectives. And I really love the title of this book, The Three Little Wolves and the Big Bad uh, Pig, because I think this is one of the things we need to do. We need to change roles. And to be able to communicate, we need to learn uh, each other's language. Again, as I was mentioning when we were covering the Global Risks Report. So I was uh, taking a look at this strategic intelligence tool from uh, the World Economic Forum, which in it's a part of arts and culture is curated by the Smithsonian. And it's interesting to see how they, uh, they coming from the vault, actually see arts and culture. Uh, and I think it can give us a few hints on how we can uh, approach different walks of life in the future. So if it's been really hard to survive uh, through this phase of uh, coronavirus, can we give more focus to education, to uh, initiatives we can do with cities in terms of making more, them more inclusive? Um, if you take a look at arts in education and you follow the lines, you see that, for instance, the uh, fifth uh, blue dot is future of economic progress. There, there are three things that are certain in the future. One is the economic crisis. So uh, from five to 10% decrease in GDP, the global GDP. Therefore, economic progress will be top of the list. If they already see that we can have a part in the game, what can we do to be more kind of proactive and try to approach the economic arena and say, okay, we're here to play. Uh, what can we bring to the party? What can we get from it? Um, the other thing is health, not only mental health, but health in general. Uh, one of the things that have been discussed a lot is uh, biodiversity. So the less biodiversity we have, the more um, vulnerable to pandemics we are. And we know there's a huge link between cultural diversity and biodiversity. Can we play a role in that? I think there's room for us to, to deal with that. And all different things related to uh, education in terms of, for instance, the future of work. We are already discussing that the future of work is something obviously unknown. So we don't really know the careers we're gonna have. The forecasts say that uh, anyone getting into the market today will have at least five different careers uh, along his life. So can we imagine I'm a doctor, tomorrow I'll be an engineer, and then I'll be, I don't know what, and maybe I'm, I already am, but what I do doesn't really have a name. So there, everything is, is just happening right now. So it's really uh, difficult to forecast what's gonna be my profession, my job title. But one of the things they are sure of in all different reports is that we need to have these skills of the future. And most of the so-called skills of the future have to do with culture. So the ability to develop empathy, to have social uh, skills, to have a kind of uh, space orientation, uh, anything related to 3, 4D, um, emotional intelligence, uh, not only tolerance, but uh, 
eager to uh, to to openness to learn and eagerness to to um, to deal with diversity, teamwork. So everything that arts and culture are related with, I tend to believe. Therefore, there's a huge role for us to play there too. If you can only try to shift the approach to uh, the perspective to the problem, maybe can find different spots of um, uh, blue dots there. So just to uh, introduce you a little bit more, a little bit more to this platform, which is actually open at the uh, World Economic Forum, you can see all things that re they relate to rights of artists, they relate to uh, culture and creative industries, of course. And then if you go, if, if you shift and you get out of the center and you put, for instance, fourth industrial revolution within the bubble, uh, and you follow the lines, you see that one of the things that are really critical to the fourth industrial revolution, which is something that will call everybody's attention in the post-COVID, because that's part of the, the uh, future of the economic recovery, has to do with ethics and identity. And if you follow the lines, you see that arts and culture are related to that. So <clears throat> if, if the fourth industrial revolution is top of the, uh, of the agenda, how can we actually uh, propose something to be also at the top of the agenda because they're gonna be needed. So I think that um, we need to make sure that people understand us not as the ones who are all, always looking for money, uh, asking for this, asking, asking for that, who are in need of, but uh, we need to be sure that we are seen as someone, as people who can actually bring uh, solutions who can actually contribute to the economic recovery, who can actually make sure uh, that the cities really are inclusive and not just uh, pay lip service to the speech, um, entrepreneurship, all different things that we do. Because quite frankly, if uh, artists really know how to survive, really know how to be entrepreneurs. So I think that we have a lot to, to teach. Uh, this is just an insight. I. Uh, I take for, for myself this uh, daily message being in Brazil in the current uh, pandemic, uh, in the current political situation, that we need to make sure that every day we build new unlikely connections uh, in our minds, in our hearts, uh, in our network, that we, um, we are able to have new ingredients for recipes that are completely unpredictable because we don't really know what would happen next. So uh, the more ingredients we have, uh, the more um, satisfied we'll be with the, the uh, actual results of the, the recipe. But again, I was just taking a look at the, uh, the other keynotes and I was watching the videos and Hanks and so forth and said, oh my God, this is going to be so boring and so tiring. And it's going to be the uh, third or fourth day, they all, right? they all know they're going to be exhausted. And I've been talking about numbers and the World Economic Forum, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted to, to finish with something that is really touching for us. And I believe that uh, not only for Brazilians, this is the area you may recall where uh, early uh, last year on 25th of January last year, we had a dam disaster. So more than 200 people died, a very beautiful area, amazing place, uh, very special. Uh, and also um, the, the place to have different initiatives that were already in place uh, related to civil society, to cultural centers and so forth. And one of the most special places we have uh, in cultural terms in Brazil is Inhotim. Inhotim is, as we will see, the biggest open air museum uh, in the world. And it's also a botanical garden, very special place uh, run by a guy, a millionaire uh, who comes from the mining sector, uh, kind of a paradox, but anyway. Uh, so he uh, decided to establish this place with his own money and then he started dealing with all different areas. So as you, as you can see, this, is, this used to be on the left side of the screen, it used to be the place, this is the current place after the disaster, but in your team is still there. So in your team itself was not affected by, by the dam disaster, but the, uh, you know, most of the staff had something to do uh, with the area, lived in the city, lost someone or so forth. Uh, and Inyoting has been organizing uh, loads of initiatives to make sure that people can cope with this new phase. So the pandemic for people living in Brumadinho, this area, was already there, uh, but with a different name. 
it's it's the second year they are going through the pandemic uh, and i think that the things they are doing there are really uh, inspiring for us who are currently going through a new pandemic we can learn a lot from these people and I, i'm sure that there are many different uh histories stories in the uh, in the room uh, people from all different places in africa in asia uh in in europe uh, related to um inspiration to uh, people who, uh, you know, are kind of enlightened, um, telling about their own stories. And I, this is a little bit of, of my heart I'd like to bring to you through in your team. O Inhotim é o maior museu a céu aberto do mundo. E aqui, Cada espaço tem uma história, tem um sentido, tem um afeto, tem um sentimento. E através da Orquestra de Câmara em Otim, nós queremos transmitir a todos vocês um pouco dessa experiência. Demonstrando que mesmo à distância, esse lugar continua sempre surpreendente. Okay, so uh, the members of the orchestra are local people, and uh, we can see the the benefits and the um, the help of music in their lives in overcoming the different the difficult situations they are going through, and I think they have loads of things to teach us. Therefore, uh, I I, uh, I don't really believe that anybody can say that we don't have a role as uh, creative industries in the current crisis. And I uh, firmly believe that we're going to have an increasing role in, in the future, in the post-COVID. Okay, back to you, Mark. Great. Thank you very, very much, Ana Carla. So, folk, this is your chance to ask um, any questions. Um, it does look like from the comments and so on that people would like more of the music to be played. Um, <laughs> but if we could just use the rest of our time to make any commentary or ask Ana Carla anything we'd like. Tom Creed, please go ahead. Hello from Ireland. Um, uh, thank you for that. It, I was, it was interesting for me um, to hear you talk about how the World Economic Forum uh, are really focusing on the intrinsic uh, values of culture. Um, and I think one of the, um, the dilemmas that I come across certainly in terms of trying to advocate for the arts is uh, whether we should be making the intrinsic argument or the economic argument for the arts. Um, obviously the arts is an industry and the arts is work. Um, do you think that um, uh, that leaders and uh, economic leaders and political leaders are more likely to pay attention to the uh, intrinsic argument or to the economic one? Um, well, th thank you, Tom. Uh, I'm not really sure that World Economic Forum already is paying attention to that. Uh, I think that the, uh, the report is there uh, but it's basically not the main conclusion they will get from it. So I think we need to make that point. And I don't think, uh, I may have a bias because I'm, I'm an economist by background. Uh, so uh, it's very, but I'm economics of, I deal with economics of culture. So I think that um, things, you don't really have to choose uh, 
I think that both arguments and many more arguments, you know, the, the, uh, the contribution of, of culture to all different things, including to economics, uh, need to be, to be played. But the one thing is that I, uh, I try to use economics in favor of the arts and not the other way around. So, uh, for instance, if you have, uh, in the current situation, even if you have a mayor or a governor talking about Brazil and Latin America, so more, uh, I'm not sure it's the case in Ireland, but if you have a governor that is really passionate about arts and culture, uh, but he knows that he's going to face a, uh, an economic crisis of less 10% GDP, there's no way you guarantee that you have uh, an interesting budget for the arts and culture if you don't really show that besides everything, you also have an economic contribution. Because, uh, you know, so it's, I think we need to play with all different tools we have and the economic uh, side is one of them. But obviously the economic side doesn't exist if the artistic side is not there. So the, the heart of the thing is the, uh, the artistic contribution uh, regardless to the economic contribution. But I think we need to, to make justice to the economic uh, benefit of the arts and culture. We need to, to work more with that. Uh, it's still very new actually to, to many countries. Um, the UK has been you know, producing loads of reports over decades, uh, also France in, in a way, but for many of the other countries to renew. So you still face uh, both economists and uh, artists who don't really want to speak to each other. And it's a problem because they don't really reach a conclusion for the benefit of everybody, uh, in my view. But um, maybe just to, to take that question a little bit further, Anna Carla, um, if you look at all the different countries, um, well, most of the different countries that have been affected by COVID-19 so far, um, the arts and culture sector is the one that is probably amongst the most devastated. And in terms of the lockdowns that might prevail to deal with the spread of the virus, um, again, the performing arts and the arts sector are the ones that are most likely to be at the end before, in terms of you know being being unlocked. Um, so if governments and have have cottoned on to the economic contribution of the creative sector as has been uh, pushed by UNESCO and UNCTAD for the last 10 to 15 years at least. Why is there such limited support for the creative industries in this particular time? Uh, well, Mike, we met at the UN. So uh, we have uh, worked a lot for all different agencies at the United Nations. I'm not really sure that our governments really pay attention to the UN, quite frankly. Uh, I think that they need to have more kind of, um, and I think we need to advocate for the economic contribution of arts and culture because otherwise they won't realize it. I think we need to lobby for the arts and culture. And we haven't been doing that, at least not, not here. So we don't really have, uh, also at the political agenda, we don't really have uh, uh, deputies, we don't really have uh, senators who are in there for the arts and culture. Uh, we have loads of difficulties still in talking about my country, you know, um, we have loads of difficulties trying to get people together to, to advocate for their own sector. You have more organized sectors like the audiovisual, but it's really complicated to get uh, visual artists, it's really complicated to get theater people, Louise and, and Lou may correct me if I'm wrong, to speak the same language. Uh, and you also have um, a counterproductive uh, trend, or at least policy in the, in the past few years we had that, uh, of uh, support for free. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's counterproductive, not at this time, but it has been counterproductive because the society at large has been accustomed to the idea that arts need to be there for free. Therefore, you don't really have to uh, be paid, you as an artist. Uh, and you get uh, financial help from the government. Therefore, you, uh, you are kind of, um, you have an obligation to work for free. And besides that, you, uh, you do what you like. So it's not really work, right? So you need to kind of educate society that we work. We need to educate the, uh, the government that we uh, give contribution also in economic terms uh, because we do what we like 
and uh, we do a lot for all different sectors. But if you don't say that, if you don't tell them what we do, they will never realize it. And I think this is one of the problems we have here. Uh, we still have a more kind of a 40s, 50s approach to the arts and culture. You're more kind of patronizing approach to the arts. And I don't think it's the right vibe to be in. Uh, also because it's not the, the correct one. Um, and quite frankly, I, I, again, I don't really believe that the governments uh, pay much attention to what the UN says. You, know, uh, you see it from all the political debates we have within the UN. Uh, okay, so if you support this country, I won't pay UNESCO anymore. If you support that country, well, I'm not sure I'll be there. Uh, then we don't pay your fee for five years. And then the government changes and then, okay, the country is already there. So it's, uh, you know, it's, I think it's, it became much more like a political arena than a more kind of a, a regulatory one in terms of what should and should not be done. And this is why I uh, mentioned the World Economic Forum, because these are the guys most of our governments are, are listening to. So we need to make sure that we are in the right places. We need to be in UNESCO. Uh, we met there, uh, but we need to make sure that our governors are uh, in Davos, uh, listening to the messages they have to convey, I think. So um, you're the... Uh, Festival Academy basically needs to make sure that we have a presence at Davos next year and <laughs> from now on. That's the idea, or to become the Davos of the cultural sector. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll say we're unambitious. Okay, yes. so uh, Sisikus, you had um, a comment earlier. Would you like to maybe bring that comment into, into this forum? Something about um, well, Buenos Aires, the ministry there? Hi, good morning. Hey. Hello. Um, hello, just a comment that is something that is really happening here that the, this program, Culture en Casa, Culture at Home, uh, is asking artists for content, but they are not paid. And as there are not many subsidies here for helping artists during this uh, period, it's something quite sensitive and I wanted to share you, with you just for you to know. I thank you a lot for this presentation. I think it's great, but it's good to start thinking also in those details uh, for the future. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Ceci. My, my husband is Argentinian, so I, uh, I get the point. Um, we had, we had a, an interesting initiative here. We, we had a call in Sao Paulo. We had a call uh, for artists to play and they would get at least more money to uh, present um, their projects. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very much short term and it, it's again more of the same. And I think it's very valid, but it's, it, it won't solve this, the problem. Uh, I think we need to make sure that we find our way through uh, these breaches the economic breach, the educational breach, the um, urban breach, not because uh, arts and culture need to be functional, that's not the thing, but we need to make sure that we can uh, pick back in the things that are paying now in order to survive to think of the long term. Um, and I see, as you all are, all different uh, initiatives trying to be solidary to artists. Uh, maybe not as much as artists are being solidary to the society, because again, I'm not sure this is being recognized, at least not yet. But once we are, you know, hand in hand with the um, Health uh, Institute, and they uh, speak frankly at the, uh, uh, the TV news that, you know, this program is being cost benefit, and it's also doing this, this, and this to society and they advocate for us and not the other way around, I think we're gonna have more chances to be heard uh, because I, I, I don't think uh, any one of us can actually say that arts and culture are as much recognized as uh, they should be in our countries. So. Yep, well, that certainly is the case in many global South countries. There are some global North countries where it might be taken a little bit more seriously, Germany, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've just we just mentioned Angela Merkel, yeah. uh, but again, in the same news, you had to the shame of other countries. So uh, I think it's more the exception that proves the rule. Uh, 
uh, sure. than the tool itself, unfortunately. Stavros, um, how's your connection? Would you like to pause, pose your question? Stavros there? Anyway, he said he's got problems with his connection, so it's better for him to write his question here. Thank you for a great presentation. At the moment, I'm a member of a committee set up by the Cyprus Youth Organization in order to suggest cultural events and projects to be funded by the organization. With Cyprus having reached zero new cases since two weeks ago, I dilemma is as follows. Would it be more sensible to spend our budget on post-COVID projects or propose ideas which can be easily adaptable to a not yet COVID-free world? Thanks a lot. Um, I feel very uncomfortable uh, answering because I don't really know your situation. I've never been to Cyprus yet. Um, but I think that uh, if you really want to talk to people, you need to put uh, their shoes or their hats, depending on the, uh, the country, the, the same changes. Um, but I think that if you're focusing on Europe, we will most likely uh, be talking to uh, post-COVID projects, not because of the virus itself, because the virus will go eventually, uh, but the uh, changing habits, the uh, new behaviors that will arise from the virus. So it's, it's not really the virus and we'll have more pandemics, but what will be the legacy of this, of this pandemic, I think will be, will be the thing. So if you focus on, on post-COVID, uh, in this sense, I think you, um, you'll be talking to more people if your target, for instance, is, is Europe, which I tend to believe is the case. Um, and congratulations on your zero new cases. It's, um, it's a dream for us. Yeah, it's a dream for Brazilians at the moment. Um, Sigrid, uh, you have a question, comment? I'm um, still you. muted, Sigrid. You need uh, now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Now I'm picking up my phone, so I'm outside. Perhaps you, you will not hear me so good. Uh, I'm happy for the presentation because I'm also coming from the cultural economics. But for example, what I see in Latin America, there is some uh, new laws. For example, the government of Colombia had uh, created a new law that is called Orange Economy Law. And we were glad because it's just for the creative and um, art, artist sector. But now with all the situation, we don't see the application of this law. So it's only a good document, a, a good paper, but uh, the, then the application and the implementation is zero. And this happened quite uh, often in Latin America. And I would like to know if you have any ideas or, or, or the other examples that can give us this feedback because with this law we can perhaps do something in the future. But now the artists are in a bad situation, although we have a new law for artists. Thank you. Yeah. I promise yeah. you it's not something which is peculiar to Latin America. <laughs> it's, it's, it's our experience here as well and in many other countries. <laughs> But Anna's yeah. going to come up with the answer now. Well, yeah, I'll try to. Um, I think that Ivan Buke had this uh, idea of developing the orange economy since he was at the IADB and then as a senator when he passed the law. Uh, and he, um, we, we have worked together in two missions and I think he was very much trying to make that happen. Uh, but against all odds, uh, it didn't. So I, I, uh, I get the situation there. Um, it's, it's hard to, to say this because it kind of, of breaks my heart, but I tend to be more kind of positive towards what uh, cities and uh, regional governments are doing. And I'm less and less uh, a believer in uh, national governments, at least in the national governments we are used to in Latin America, because it's in the cities that lives happen. Uh, it's in the cities where we have more kind of control uh, of uh, rules, of laws, of uh, where the guy is having his coffee. So I think it's more kind of a human, uh, you, you do, and you do have more kind of interaction with what's being discussed. It, it's, it probably is not the case uh, with uh, Germany and other uh, kind of political organizations, but it's definitely 
the situation in Latin America. I believe you're a Colombian. Uh, and I, uh, I, I see all different cities trying to do things differently. So for instance, if you, um, uh, if you take Brazil, uh, to mention a country that I know more, you could take, for instance, Florianópolis. And I think Florianópolis in Southern Brazil is doing a very interesting job trying to match cultural industries and cultural diversity to uh, the technological industries, therefore the creative industries at large. Uh, if you take a small city and you go to Chile, in Southern Chile, you have Frutillar. Frutillar is a 50,000 city, uh, inhabitant city. And they became a kind of a, very clever of them. They became a kind of um, um, trial place for the federal government. So Chile is, I don't know, do you have any Chileans here? No, Chileans? No, no? okay. So I can lie a lot, no problem. Uh, in Chile, you have Santiago and you have the rest of the country normally, right? So the, the rest of the country, I always say the government only thinks of Santiago, uh, the capital city and not the rest of the country. So Frutillar, just to give you an idea, is in Southern Chile, a small city. It would probably never be seen in this kind of mindset, telling you what I hear from my Chilean colleagues. And Frutillar, uh, along the years, managed to um, have kind of international organizations working with them to show the value of creativity in arts for education. So they had a pilot in Frutillar. And then the value of uh, creativity in arts for urban organization, and they had a master plan. Uh, so it became a pilot for the master plan in Frutillar. And along the years, they became a pilot for all different stuff related to culture, arts, creativity, and whatever. Uh, and it was a very clever uh, initiative of them coming from uh, a very small uh, place. Uh, they are now a part of the uh, UNESCO network of creative cities in music. Uh, they have a huge, amazing, beautiful theater uh, where you can see uh, the mountains. So it's, uh, it's very much focusing on, on tourism and they see that their cultural diversity, their identity and whatever they produce in terms of innovation are assets for this future they want to reach. Uh, and I think you have all different kinds of configurations in, in different places. Uh, from small cities to uh, places like uh, Florianopolis, which is uh, uh, capital city. Yeah, the so, theater is alive. exactly, Luis. Yeah, so in a way, if if artists can somehow do it, rather than wait for policy to be implemented, rather to be doing things and let policy follow what has been done. In other words, if you are able to show the impact of the arts, then maybe politicians will come to the party subsequently. I'm not sure if that's what you're kind of saying. But anyway, we've got a lot of, 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 of questions here, so let's not bother with my question. We have uh, Matteo from Italy. Hi, Anna. Thank you for being with us today. I have a question on communication of what the value we represent. You know, most of us are artistic directors, but also are the same people who advocate for their own project with institutions. And you are uh, at, the other part, at the other side of the desk and you, you have the, one of those people we always like to know because um, you receive our projects, our papers, and you make choices. You know the people who make choices. Um, so how do we claim our value? What do you want to hear? I think um, I think when we talk about arts and culture, it's all so very general. Uh, if you look at the dictionary, there will be written culture and arts. The culture is arts, manifestation of human intellectual, social behavior, ideas, customs. So we all know the more we are specific, the more our value is communicated. And if we say culture, we say everything and nothing. Um, right now in Italy, artists are claiming their value saying they represent the 16% of the GDP. And I'm just laughing because it's, how can we claim our value by telling our institutions we represent the 16%? I know it's something, but come on, it's nothing compared to other economical system of our own nation. So I always like um, writers because um, when they claim they new book uh, is a bestseller, 
and they didn't sell one copy yet, the book will be sold like a bestseller. You know, they claim their book is the best and the coolest one. They write bestseller and that will be sold like a bestseller. I think writers have something to teach us. Um, what could you tell us about communication <laughs> of our value? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting question. Well, first of all, I'm not really at the other side of the desk because I'm an entrepreneur myself. Uh, but I, yeah, I know what you're saying. And I work at, uh, I actually worked at the other side of the desk because I worked 15 years for multinationals, including 10 years for Unilever. And I lived in Italy for a few years, uh, expatriated um, at Unilever. Uh, so I, I sense what you're saying. Um, the, um, the tool I use for myself is uh, what I mentioned before, is to try to understand what's the biggest problem of the government, of the person, or of the institution you're dealing with, or you're trying to reach. So if, just to give you an example, uh, we had a project here for Fiat. Uh, Fiat had a, a huge problem in, uh, in Brazil because their most fantastic, uh, mega blaster innovative uh, engineers uh, always felt alone, they felt they were not really heard, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, they were kind of the geniuses lost in the company. So we organized um, a workshop, a two-day workshop at the uh, Contemporary Art Biennial in Brazil. They, uh, they didn't know they were going to the Biennial, otherwise they would never be there because they thought that art, you know, art is art. And I'm a scientist, so I'm, I'm a genius. Uh, when they realized they were already in the building and we organized all different workshops with artists and, uh, and then we had a tour across the biennial. At the end of the two day workshop, they said, well, you know, the interesting thing for me is to realize that actually the contemporary artist is exactly myself uh, in a different uh, shape because he's not understood, uh, he's a genius, he always feels alone, etc., etc., etc." And this, this was a very interesting for, for Fiat because that's exactly what they wanted their guys to feel. So depending on what your key issue is, uh, depending on what the key issue of the government, the, the politician, whatever uh, you're trying to, to, whoever you're trying to reach or any kind of institution you want to, to work with, uh, you need to think of what, what their key issue is. This is why I believe that, uh, you know, the economic side of arts and culture at this moment and especially post COVID is going to be key because it will be top, 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 top of the agenda in the hugest recession we're going to face in the world in a century. So um, I don't, I'm not really sure that even those who like arts will have ears and openness to hear anything else. And this is why I, I think we need to find our breaches through the sectors that will tend to be considered the most important ones. You know, for the benefit of what we do, not selling ourselves and selling our souls, but uh, trying to make sure they understand we can help them and not we are asking for something. You know, maybe this is this is the message. Mm -hmm. And just um, I tell you, on behalf of writers, I'm not sure that all of us sell our work on the basis of being best sellers <laughs> before they really are. <laughs> well, yeah. so, <laughs> Mike is a best seller. <laughs> Right, um, Lily has a question. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was really informative. Um, my question is, um, you talk about the importance of lobbying for the arts, and I think this is really, really essential. And I'm just wondering, for us as festival managers, artists, creative producers, what are the tools that we can use in addition to perhaps holding policymakers hostage at biennials, what are the tools that we can use um, to, to lobby? Um. Um, I think there are, um, where do you come from? Just to, I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm based in Edinburgh, Scotland. Okay. Um, I think that you are lucky in a way because I tend to believe that you do have politicians who are more kind of open to this kind of, um, talk mm -hmm. uh, and I would definitely touch base with them. Uh, one of the uh, most interesting impact studies I know is from the Edinburgh Festival. So uh, maybe that's also something you can use 
to show that you are cross-sector, you know, that you reach all different initiatives. Uh, and I would definitely try to get hold of people who are currently discussing the uh, future of work. Uh, for instance, RSA and Matthew Taylor are uh, key uh, institutions and people uh, to uh, be in touch with because I think they, they really look forward to doing something that are more kind of transformative. And if you have, as you do, uh, have this understanding of how culture and the arts can actually play a role in there, I think they will be open to, to listen to you. Uh, I tend to believe from what they do. So um, That's really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Okay, folks, it's two o'clock, but we do have one more question from Vivian. Um, in Canada. Hi, Anna Carla. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, my question is, um, with COVID-19, we've seen borders close between countries and regions. And even before there were challenges for artists to obtain visas to be able to circulate internationally. Could you speak to the subject of circulations of artists internationally and projects from an economic perspective in the current situation and in the future? Uh, well, current situation, um, I wouldn't really have much to say because, well, it's the situation you just mentioned. Uh, and I think it's going to be harder and harder, uh, especially for uh, developing countries. Because when crises strike, especially economic crises, people tend to be kind of in the extremes, as you know. So uh, I think it will depend a lot on how each government is run. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm getting increasingly concerned about uh, the trends we're seeing in the elections in all different countries, from Poland to Hungary to, you know, many places in Latin America and so forth. So I think this is a caveat and we need to make sure that we, um, we do what we can to, to preserve a democracy. So uh, I don't really have an answer to your question. Um, I would try to uh, work with networks trying to overcome these difficulties that will definitely arise. Uh, but again, I think it will depend a lot on, on the governments. And this is an extra reason for lobbying. I think it kind of goes to your, to your question earlier, uh, or your answer earlier on about um, policy and United Nations and so on, Carla, where, as you know, UNESCO 2005 convention actually encourages the circulation of artists and that you know global north markets are provide preferential access to creative products and artists from the global south but of course security within the global north kind of trumps you know unesco kind of recommendations in the 2005 convention so so yeah you're right it's not as easy as because a protocol exists that countries who even sign up to the protocol are necessarily going to going to abide by it Okay, folk, I think that um, that's just about all of the questions, unless there is uh, one last one. Rodrigo, did you want to say something to your fellow country person? Oh, I think he had to leave, but put the question in the chat. Okay. And so, we'll watch the answer in the video afterwards. So basically he says, thank you so much for your time and presentation. And I'm sorry I have to leave now, but I have a question. Don't know if you'll have time to answer, but I'm going to watch the video. My question is, I understand what you say about artists taking it into their own hands to start being independent from public grants in general, and also change this idea that people have the arts should be for free. But how to change that? I mean, what kind of actions, suggestions for this long-term plan can we start to adopt in countries like Brazil, where the arts in general are seen as luxury? I'm sorry to leave, but well, there we go. Okay, Rodrigo, I'm not sure where you uh, work, uh, but you can tell me later because we can be in touch afterwards. Um, I think that we'll have, it will have to be a kind of a many fronts uh, agenda because obviously you can't just change a, a castle uh, moving one brick, you need to, to change it all. Uh, but from an, uh, an artist's point of view, which I tend to believe is your case, or a festival organizer, you need to, uh, you need to, I would recommend you not to uh, play for free, but to start charging symbolic fees or to start charging um, one kilo of rice, whatever, because uh, we are very strange as human beings. Whenever you put one dollar, be it one dollar, 
you do believe you internally feel that you need to be there. So yeah, the level of the, the rate of no show reduces dramatically. It's, it's absurd, but we really are uh, strange people. Yeah, the pay as you can policy is, is very good too. I really like it, provided you actually show the costs. And there's a, a small experience I'd like to mention if I have two minutes, Mike, left. Sure. Uh, um, there's a place very close to Brasilia, so in center Brazil, called uh, Planaltina. Uh, and Planaltina is a, a small uh, village where uh, four, four or five students of uh, PhD in history decided to have a cultural center uh, devoted to music. And they put money every month from their own pockets to bring different guys from all different places, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they had a pay-as-you-can policy. Uh, in order to make sure that people would stay more, they opened a, a very small bar where they would sell uh, basically beer and one or two more things. And they were uh, so much in need of money that just to give you an idea, they had to wait for someone to pay the bill to be able to get the money, buy beer, put in the fridge and sell more beer to the other tables. That's the kind of uh, cash flow they had. Um, and they were just stunned to see that actually when they received the, the contributions, people would pay, people who were there, so looking for different things, looking for different music, not regular people uh, in society, um, people would pay $50, say, in beer, they, they wouldn't pay $5 for the musicians. And basically because they had no clue about the costs of the whole organization. So they started putting all the costs there. Okay, uh, lightning, ta -da -da, museum, fee, blah, 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 travel, costs, logistics, blah, 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 blah. And at the end, people started giving more to uh, the musicians than to the beer because they realized then what was behind. So if you're talking to people who have no idea of the costs related to arts and culture, we need to make sure that they understand before we ask them to, to give what they believe is interesting. Um, well, thank you very much for that, Anna, and for your, for your stimulation um, during this particular exercise. I'd like to maybe suggest, Inga, that we take on board the theme that seems to have emerged out of this, or one of the important themes, and that is, how do we lobby and advocate for the arts within our societies? I mean, it's an old chestnut. We've spoken about this for decades, but we're within new conditions now, the COVID-19 conditions. There's going to be a post-COVID time a more kind of immediate time that's going to happen soon after that, and then it's going to be a post-vaccination time. Um, but for, we are always going to have to lobby for the arts somehow. So shall we um, maybe keep that as a topic for us, maybe even to discuss in the roundtables tomorrow? Um, right now, we are kind of a bit over time. It's about 10 past two. We did want people to have a bit of a break before we have the roundtables at 2.30. At so um, if you don't mind, Aaron, if we could hang on to that question, we can maybe keep it for tomorrow. Um, and then uh, let's have the break now. And then Inga, I'm not sure if you want to talk about um, the round tables now. Yes, I will say something about the round tables when I've concluded the session. So thank you very much, Mike, for facilitating this conversation. Thank you very much, Anna Carla, for everything that you've raised. I think the very important thing of uh, the fact that culture is so much more and can contribute to society, which is something that we raised in the beginning also, that festivals are platforms, that there are people currently who are helping with mental health, there are uh, festivals or, or art organizations helping with, with uh, food distribution or, or creating access to children who don't have digital access. So I think this role is very important that we are so much more than just um, organizations that present art and artists. So. You, you managed also to say in one minute what we are trying to do here, to bring people together from all over the world to think about and reflect on the complexity of the world of today and to do that with people coming from very different perspectives. So it was really great uh, to have you here. Uh, for those who are following the live stream, we will be back at um, 7.30 Central European summer time. Uh, I hope we are still alive by then. Um, for a panel with um, Kate Craddock from uh, Gift Festival and Vincent de Repontigny from OFTA Montreal to tackle um, 
how to to run an online festival so see you there thank you very much for watching and thank you for the audience for um being so uh, attentionful with all the small children running around also which you can see in the pictures here thank you thank you for the invitation thank you everybody i've just posted my um my email should you uh, wish to be in contact afterwards and congratulations again inge and mike what an amazing program really delighted to see everything happening especially in these uh, circumstances which make them uh, even more powerful and useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.